Victor Kravets mirrored Jonathan Edwards' feat with a world record in triple jump. The peerless Nuruddin Morsali claimed the 1500 metres title. This year, he also improved his own world record. Ethiopian Haile Gebre Selassie took the 10,000 metres gold and also set two new world records in 1995. And Kenyan Moses Kiptanui remains unbeatable at steeplechase. He became the first man to break the eight-minute barrier. He'll have to keep an eye on his teammate, who'll come barefoot to the park in Atlanta, Christopher Koskai. Another man to rewrite the record books was Sergei Bubka, five world titles running for him now. And for the incomparable Michael Johnson, three gold medals at 200 metres, 400 and the 4x400 relay. Think what he might do playing at home in the Olympics. But British athletics has its new superstar, who in 1995 took a running jump into sporting legend. And just last night in Monte Carlo, Jonathan Edwards was named as Athlete of the Year. Gwen Torrance won the women's title. And here with us tonight is Jonathan Edwards. A round of applause, I think, for a marvellous year. <laughs> we'll explain the kit in a moment, Jonathan. Oh, but yes. yeah. but um, tell us about those terrific performances. I mean, how do you mark down the improvement, the dramatic improvement? How do you explain it? Can you explain it? Well, on one level, no. I mean, it's, it's still a big shock to me, and I watch it all on, on, the, on the monitor there, and I'm still kind of like, you know, a disbelief. Um, it's probably a culmination of things. One is many years' hard work. Um, the other thing is I've got a new technique, um, which I think has helped me a lot. And third, I've got a great team of coaches working with me, Carl Johnson, Norman Anderson, Peter Stanley. And they've helped in all different areas, helping put all the different pieces in the jigsaw together. Basically, you were stronger, weren't you, and lighter? Yes, that was yeah. Brendan's great phrase, stronger lighter and faster and, and, and I was and without really knowing why I just was in this incredible shape yeah. and, and that season happened. How do you train for your event? Do you hop, step and jump all over the place? Or, I mean, <laughs> how does it work? No, I mean, it's obviously very stressful on my legs so I try to keep jumping to a minimum. I mean, the basic area is a strength work in the gym with weights, sprinting, my speed's very important and then probably one session a week technically um, just to try and keep everything well oiled. And I'm told in that run-up, which is, what, 30, 40 mm. metres or something, that you're about as quick as Linford Christie would be over that distance. Is that right? You wouldn't beat him over 100, but up to that <laughs> distance, I'm told you're as quick as he is. Well, there was some, some analysis done in Gothenburg which said I was as quick as, as Lewis and as well as Christie, but personally, I don't believe it. <laughs> you don't believe it? Yeah. What has it meant to you? Has it changed your way of life? Well, you see these grey hairs, you know? It's all the stress. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. But has it, it, has it, what difference has it made to you? On one level, I'm exactly the same person with the same values. Um, my faith is very important, my family. Yes. Uh, but on another level, um, and you know, it's radically different. I'm just trying to get the two together and find a, a good balance. Well, best of luck for the forthcoming year, but just stay there yes. for the moment. Now, if you watch this show each year, you'll know that we usually introduce what the editor of the programme calls his fun item, which he usually thought of in a tired and emotional night back in January. Now, this year, he's trying to get us in the Guinness Book of Records. This is the plot. Once upon a time in the Olympics, there was an event called the Standing Long Jump. You know, no run-up. They did it from there, so to speak. The last official record dates back to 1904. And tonight we're going to have a crack at it, or rather Jonathan Edwards is, hence the, the gear. And so are rugby union star and former school pal of Jonathan, Steve O'Jomo. <laughs> Multi... There's a man who will hop, step and jump for you. Multi-gold medalist in rowing, Steve Redgrave. <laughs> Rugby League's Martin O'Fire. <laughs> we have a lady too, Britain's number one long jumper, Denise Lewis. Britain's number one javelin thrower, Steve Backley. <laughs> there we are. We have the competitors, but what are they going to jump into? Let's show you.
we are, ladies and gentlemen. There we have the long jump pit. I think the boys were actually doing it to music. Well done, lads. Terrific stuff there. Now, you will notice that along the side there, um, there are four marks. Uh, the Women's UK Best, 2 metres 81. The Women's World Best, 292. That 1904 world record I was talking about, 347. Then there's a couple of unofficial records. Men's UK Best, 355. And the Men's World Best, 371. So those are the marks. We'll be looking to see if our volunteers uh, can beat tonight. We have our officials here, our official officials, suitably blazered and flannelled, uh, as you can see. Um, with the, uh, you see they've got the cutting edge of technique in measuring there. With, <laughs> with, with, um, got the old tape. So I think we're all ready to, uh, to have a go. And it's ladies first, I think. Den lady. La lady. 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 lady, that's right. Yeah. Lady. Denise Lewis. Come on, Denise, let's see what you can do. And, uh, Incidentally, uh, Paul Dickinson will be doing the commentary as ever. Paul. Well, welcome, Denise. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want these athletes, these great athletes, to jump a long way, I think a bit of audience participation is required here. It's a great tradition in athletics now. So, Denise Lewis first to go. The target, 2 metres 81. <laughs> now then, how close to the record is that? I'll tell you what, Denise could give the men a few problems here. What's this? Denise, one of the best heptathletes in the world and heading for Atlanta next year. That looks pretty close to the record to me. Now then, what's the, what's the measurement, Brian? It is 274. 274. Look, you just... Pretty good, but you, you just missed the women's... UK best. Yeah, I know. I think I dropped my feeting. A bit of technical input there. I dropped my feeting just at the last minute. So I think I should have another go. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to get your breath back first, yes, though. You I get know. your breath back first. So, okay, you can have another go. Special rule for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> right, now, it's uh, Steve Redgrave. Let's see what Steve can do. So, so Steve, up. three Olympic gold medals. Heading for a fourth next year. I'm looking very nervous. Bit of clapping. <laughs> now, the big question is not world records, but has that been Denise Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> I think Steve at... might want another go after watching yeah. that. Now, let's get your measurement there, um, Steve. Wow. Well. It is 286. 286, 286. Well, very pleased with that. Yes. No, you. Well, that's my personal best. <laughs> First time I've ever done it, but it's, it's personal best. best. <laughs> Knowing you, you've been in training for about three months for <laughs> no, that. Not no, quite. no, okay. Not quite. Steve, well done. Thank you very much indeed. Another Steve. Now, Steve Ojomo. And the thing about this man is Jonathan Edwards might be the world record holder at triple jump. But this man is the school record holder at the same school. Is that right? <laughs> that is right. At, at triple jump. Oh! oh. Now then. <laughs> <laughs> now for those of you not familiar with long and triple jump measurements, Watch I'll this again. We've got to measure it from the point which is nearest the takeoff board. Well, <laughs> well Steve normally used to jumping vertically. Perhaps that was the problem. Yeah. Are we going to do a measure? You're not well, even going to bother. Well, we'll no, uh, we'll leave that one we'll out. Yeah. We might give you another go, Steve, in a moment. We'll, we'll see how we go for time here now. Martin O'Fire. Now, Martin O'Fire knows how to win things. Martin, it's, we're all set for you. Back got the pull one. Oh, it was a great win yesterday by Wigan for Martin O'Fine. Sprinters, fast men are normally very, very good at this. Martin, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Toe mustn't be on the white line. It wasn't, was it? It was, yeah. OK. No, you're all right. <laughs> I think that's what's called milking the crowd. Come on, Martin. Oh! oh that's a big one. 
That might have just been the women's world record, which incidentally is held by a Norwegian ski jumper. All right, let's Watch measure this again. It. Oh, only just in the front of the pit. So he needs 286 to go into the lead. Well, we have our three metre jump. It's 305. 305. Well done. Happy with that? No, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. We're happy with that. OK. Fine. Right, now we've got Steve Backley, the big man. Ready? So Steve yeah. Backley, double European, double Commonwealth javelin champion. When he was warming up out there, he said he might actually have a problem making the pit. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> so come on, let's get this clapping going, see if we can take him over three metres, five centimetres. I'm not sure I've I'm ever seen a minus measurement in standing line, John. <laughs> not too good, Steve. We'll try and put a javelin competition on for you next year. Oh. Right. Bad luck, Steve. Thanks. You did, you were out there, but you came back. Never mind. <laughs> OK, right. Let's have a look at the scores so far. We've got them on the uh, monitor there for you. Martin O'Fire's out front at the moment. Now, Jonathan Edwards. It's the big one. Jonathan, here we go. <laughs> Not just the world record holder, but also the Gateshead Harriers record holder. The same uh, club as Brendan Foster, but uh, the only difference is this guy's jumped about 30 feet further. <laughs> so come on, Jonathan Edwards, the world champion, world record holder for triple jump. I have to tell you, he did more than that with his clothes on this afternoon in, uh, in practice. Now, come on, Jonathan, he's just got off a plane from Monte Carlo, where, of course, he picked up the award for the best athlete. But at the moment, Martin O'Fire is still in the lead with three metres, five centimetres. Brian? And it is 2.97. Oh, bad luck. <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> Martin's out front. Martin's out front. But hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. You may not be the winner yet, Martin, because oh, okay. Denise oh. is having one more go. <laughs> and Denise has got more than just a good chance of beating this record, which is held by Clover Court, who herself is a British international heptathlete. This would be brilliant if she could get a new British record for Denise Lewis. Now, how close is that? Denise, a little bit of a reaction, good or bad? Average. Average. <laughs> average, very average. Good technique. And well, good luck next year in Atlanta. Things are obviously going very well. Yes, preparation's going very well, thanks. Well, it is 2 metres 76. Oh, <laughs> bad luck. Great try. Thank you for taking part. <laughs> well... Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't get in the Guinness Book of Re Records. We'll have a word with the editor. He'll come up with something for next year. But they've been great sports. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs> well done, Martin. That's the full score there. Martin O'Fire's jump of three metres and five centimetres would have actually won him a bronze medal in the Olympic Games in 1904. Jonathan Edwards, world champion in second place, and Steve Redgrave in third. Well done to everybody. Now, the cricket year. It began with England on the back foot in Australia. A few weeks later, Australia were winning in the West Indies, the first time the West Indies had lost a series at home since 1973. And also in the history books now is Mike Atherton's innings, just this last week, that saved the second test in Johannesburg. David Gower is in South Africa to review the events of the year. Well, it's certainly a warm welcome to you all from South Africa. It actually reminds me a bit of the scorching summer we had at home this year, which went along with some red-hot cricket. Geoffrey Boycott is with me to help review the year's cricket. So why don't we get straight on with the story, which began with Chairman Ray Illingworth ringing the changes. Peter Martin was one of the new faces for the Texaco Trophy, which England won 2-1. But the gloom descended over England again in the first test at Headingley. And even local hero Darren Goff failed to brighten the picture. The Yorkshire hero arrives and goes, and the crowd has hardly had time to blink. 
England renewed acquaintances with an old enemy as Ian Bishop made a successful comeback to the Test Arena with a 5 for 32 helping the West Indies to a nine wicket victory. He didn't know it at the time, but there were brighter days ahead for Mike Atherton. It was a hot afternoon, the last day of June, and the sun was a demon. England again relied on a Derbyshire paceman for the second test. Not Devon Malcolm, but debutant Dominic Cork, who'd led the attack. Paul Mark Ramprakash collected an unfortunate pair. While Graham Thorpe was made well aware of the hostile nature of this West Indies attack. Graham Hick and Robin Smith still took the fight to the tourists. And then Darren Goff joined Graham Thorpe in the queue for the headache tablets. And if the West Indies hadn't heard of Dominic Cork before, they had now. And there it is. The victory for England. They've won this Lord's Test match handsomely. And Dominic Cork has taken seven wickets on his debut in Test cricket. The pitch was the deciding factor at Birmingham. But Mike Atherton chose to trust his instincts and made this prediction. And a strange looking pitch, but I think it'll play all right. Maybe not. Oh, it's in the air, he's gone. That's a real surprising bounce, and that's the nature of this pitch. The West Indies, on the other hand, forgot about the conditions and attacked the English bowling, setting their bowlers up for a second innings onslaught. Robin Smith bore the brunt, but the crowd weren't happy. Well, not very pleasant, most of that. Geoffrey, what did you make of that pitch? Well, it's one of the worst-looking test pitches I've ever seen. It was like piebald, grassy and dry, two-paced, uneven bounce. I was glad I wasn't batting, I was only watching. But we did make a cock-up of selection. We didn't play our fastest bowler, Devon Malcolm. He was sat on his backside watching it on TV. England sprang the first shock before the match with a recall for 42-year-old John Embury. One of the hottest days in a blistering summer provided a situation heaven sent for umpire Dickie Bird. <laughs> We'd seen everything now. Dickie couldn't take it. It was a simple case of sun stops play. But Bird wasn't the only one dazzled at Manchester. Oh, that's the first wicket of the day. Dominic Cork has the knack of making things happen. Big appeal. He's got him. Two wickets in two balls. Well, it's another good shout. He's done it. Dominic Cork has a hat trick. What an effect this man, Dominic Cork, is having on this game of cricket. Despite some anxious moments, England made it home by six wickets to level the series. But Robin Smith eventually succumbed to the West Indies bowlers, suffering a fractured cheekbone. He joined his counterpart, Jimmy Adams, who also sustained a similar injury, both men out for the rest of the series. So, with the series perfectly poised, the tension grew. England's totals mounted, mainly thanks to Graham Hick and Michael Atherton. It had been a quiet summer so far for the world's best batsman, but all that was to change. He was at his brilliant best at Nottingham and the Oval with centuries in both tests. England looked doomed at Nottingham, but Watkinson and the injured Illingworth came to the rescue with a heroic last wicket stand. The heat was on out in the middle, but some stayed cool, while others bowed out altogether. Well, the series finished in a welter of runs, hundreds all round, it seemed. Geoffrey, what was your final analysis of that series? Well, the most heartening aspect for me, David, was the way England fought back from being 1-0 down and 2-1 down. In the past, if they've been 1-0 down, they've gone under. This time, they showed some fights, some bottle, they got stuck in, and I think that heartened everybody in the country. Then on top of that, it was Brian Lara, a brilliant player, 300. Some of his shot-making was breathtaking, and I'm glad the English public were privileged to see him, and I'm sure it gave them a lot of pleasure because he is one of the best three players I've ever seen. Lord saw one of the great one-day innings by Kent Sri Lankan Aravinda De Silva. 
but his magnificent 112 wasn't enough to stop a third Benson Hedges triumph for Lancashire. In a rain-interrupted NatWest final, Northants saw their hopes slip away, with Warwickshire's Roger Twos given the chance to make a match-winning 68. Skipper Dermot Reeve celebrated yet another addition to the Edgbaston Trophy cabinet. In the AXA Equity and Law Sunday League, rain ruined Worcestershire's title hopes. Not the best way to win, but Kent weren't complaining. Major feats in the county championship included a hat-trick for Mark Eilert as he took 9 for 19 against Northants. The title race went to the final match thanks to Middlesex's stunning one-run win at Uxbridge. But Warwickshire made no mistakes against Kent to seal their second successive title. Congratulations. Very well played. See you eh? Thank you. What a waste of champagne. So, Warwickshire, once again the dominant force on the county scene. Geoffrey, how much of that is due to Dermot Reeve? A lot. I think he's the best captain in England. He had Alan Donald, who was the best fast bowler and bowled really well for him. But I think Dermot's one of those guys, he knows the game inside out, he's got an instinctive feel for captaincy, he's prepared to be innovative and try things and not blame his players if things don't go as he planned. Well, England's current captain isn't doing too badly. England's first tour down here in South Africa for just over 30 years. And the Wanderers here, the scene of that wonderful 185. How good was that? I think brilliant. One of the greatest backs to the walls innings I've ever seen. I don't think Michael will play better than that in the rest of his career. And it just shows how important it is saving a test match as much as winning one. But it's still not not. He's got him. That's the record for Jack Russell being the wicketkeeper. 11 dismissals in the match. So what's going to happen for the rest of the series? I think it's good for England, really, because they're on the up, psychologically up. South Africa are really down after not winning. All right, well, I hope there's some celebrations from South Africa in the not-too-distant future. We'll leave you now to your own celebrations at home for Christmas and the rest of it. Hope it all goes well. That's all from us here in Johannesburg. Let's just, though, leave the final word to England's captain, Michael Atherton. It was my career best score for England. Um, it was a timely knock in that it came on the last day of the second Test match, which secured a draw for us at the Wanderers in Johannesburg. Hopefully the team's performance can inspire us to a third test victory in Natal. Wishing you a Merry Christmas from sunny Cape Town. This year, many new faces emerged while some old favourites continue to excel. We pay tribute to their achievements as well as highlight the key events from overseas, whatever the weather. And in the winter, extra blankets for the cold. The World Championships cancelled as the snow deserted the Spanish peaks. Vreni Schneider melted hearts with her final fling. She dominated the World Cup season, as did Alberta Tomba, still the super G-force of the slopes. Young blade Stephen Cousins was the best Briton since namesake Robin at the World Figure Skating Championships in Birmingham. Sheffield Steelers, they've done the league and championship double. He's got it. Yes. Yeah. World Indoor Champion, Andy Thompson. When it's spring again. A beautiful I'll April Fool's Day was no laugh for Oxford as the rhythm of the light blues made it a hat trick for Cambridge. Poland's Sabanska sprang a surprise in the London Marathon. And there was a special Mexican wave for Seron, the first man to retain his title. David Holding Silver rose Hill Gold in the wheelchair events. Prolific Paralympian Noel Thatcher won two European golds. And again, going for that double pickup and bounces him down. Brilliant. European champion, 1995, Nigel Donahue. Go for the belt for the sacrifice throw. Nicola Fairbrother, European champion for the third time. Simon Jackson grappled his way to more medals. The Paralympic king added world gold. champions for the third consecutive year. Britain were best in basketball and rugby at the Europeans. In Birmingham, Australia were rarely ruffled as they took home netball's world title again. In the summertime when the weather is 
Saddle saw Yvonne McGregor broke the pain barrier and won our world cycling record in Manchester. The wheels kept turning for Miguel Indurain, five historic Tour de France wins in a row and his first world championship gold. The flying Scot then, Graham O'Brien. He's going to be a double world champion. William Fox Pitt emerged from individual success at Gatcombe to enjoy international honours with Britain's three-day event team, crowned Europe's elite. And it was hats off to Nick Skelton, his first individual gold in show jumping's World Cup. At Hickstead, Captain John Leddingham commanded attention with a second successive derby double. Paul Palmer won Britain's first silver in the European Swimming Championships. Graham Smith was a stroke away from gold. Adam Rutwood won backstroke bronze and Karen Pickering picked up four bronze medals. Sarah Harcastle shook them all in the World Short Course Championship, gold at last. And once again, British powerboat crews were flying in the World Championships. Gold. Peter Haining, world champion for the third successive year. Stephen Redgrave wins the ninth gold medal of his distinguished career. And this team, with Matthew Pinsent, one of the great partnerships in world sport. Yes, 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 it's my autumn overnight. He's out on his own in the world of superbikes. Carl Fogarty retains his title and remains the top British biker with the spoils. touring car title went to John Cleland, his second, aged 43. The older he gets, the better he drives. Ready! Britain's world champions were bang on target in 95. Only this week, Jamie Hawkins was on the crest of a wave, windsurfing his way to a second world gold. And the paddle power of Lynn Simpson puts her on top of the world. Hard work forgotten, success with that winning smile, whatever the sport. Well, we're even closer now to the moment when we announce your choice for BBC Sports Personality of 1995. Your votes have flooded in as usual, for which we thank you very much. Uh, but before the result, a reminder of the leading contenders. And now, to announce the top three in your voting for this year's sports personality, the man who led Europe to that brilliant Ryder Cup win, Bernard Gallagher. Bernard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe three, two, one, yes, okay. um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased and honoured to be asked here this evening to present the sports personality of the year. And I think, without any further ado, we'll open up. And firstly, we'll go to third place. I don't know myself. Just as well. <laughs> in third place, the BBC viewers voted for somebody who had an historic achievement in 1995. By winning the RAC rally, he became Britain's first ever world rally champion, Colin McRae.
just stick this plate stand over one side of the plate. Thank you very much. And in second place, it's exciting. In second place, a man who finally achieved his ultimate ambition this year when he became the heavyweight champion of the world, Frank Bruno. And the 1995 BBC Sports Personality of the Year is... And in first place, the viewer's choice for the BBC Television Sports Personality of the Year is someone who leapt to stardom in 1995. <laughs> Sure, I can speak. Actually, it's, um, it's been an incredible year for me, and uh, this is just kind of the icing on the cake. Um, I would have never believed what's happened to me this year. I'm on camera. <laughs> Could uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know? It is just amazing. You know, I've watched this program since I was a little boy. It was on on a bad time, really, Sunday evening, because I had to go to church, and when your dad's the boss, it's difficult to get off. <laughs> um, but I'd like to say thank you for the BBC putting on this show, um, because many people, great ple pleasure. Thank you to, to the viewers for voting for me, and also for all the people who have helped and supported me. I think I've had great success, and it's really... The thing that stuck out is how many people have sacrificed without the sort of rewards that I've received this year. I want to thank them. I've mentioned my coaches, and I'd particularly like to thank my wife, Alison. You know, without her sacrifices, um, you know, I wouldn't be standing here, and also my mum and dad. And, uh, I think I'll stop now because I might embarrass myself if I've gone any longer. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. It's incredible. Thank you. Television Sports Personality for 1995 is Jonathan Edwards.